Happy Tuesday. Welcome back to Post Sports Live. I'm your host, Jonathan Forsyth. And joining me, as always, in the Post TV studios, a colleague from the Dan DC Sports, I almost called it the Dan Sports Ball, the DC Sports Ball, Dan Steinberg. How are you, man? I'm okay. Happy Tuesday. Same to you. Keith, yeah. how are you, man? You've been on the deal for a little bit. How are you? I'm back. I'm glad to be back. Welcome back. And Brandon Parker, welcome back. How are you, Thank man? You. Good, man. Doing right. good. Excellent. Happy Tuesday. We've got a lot to talk about on the show today. We're going to talk about the Redskins-Eagles game. We're going to talk about the quarterback situation, obviously, with RG3 out for at least, it looks, six to eight weeks at a minimum with the uh, dislocated ankle. Uh, we're going to talk about the Kirk Cousins situation, get some bold predictions for the Eagles. We were 0 for 4 last week, not surprisingly. We stink at bold predictions. Uh, we'll get some thoughts on the NFL as a whole and games on the slate for week three that uh, have your guys' attention. And then finally, we'll wrap up with the Nationals. This is the day, folks, that they could clinch the NL East down in Atlanta. How sweet would that be um, for the Nats to do it down at their rival's park with half, well, how many people were even there last night in Atlanta? They announced 18,000, I 18, think. That was generous, too, yeah, I bet. I think it's true. Gosh, I mean, whatever. So we'll talk about the Nationals, and, and we'll actually the angle we'll take there is whether or not you guys think that Matt Williams should deserves consideration for NL Manager of the Year. I think that there's a strong case to be made there. Uh, but let's start with the Redskins first, guys. And Dan, I want to start with you. Obviously, another crushing blow. This is three major injuries in five years going back to his college days. I want to ask you this. Under what scenario do you see Robert Griffin III playing again this year? You know, it's really hard to tell because I don't know if we are getting all the information out of Redskins Park that those people have. I you know, I think I think this depends almost more on, on Griffin's health than it does on anything that happens with Cousins. But I think that if he is healthy enough to be an actual functioning quarterback within six, seven, eight weeks, something like that, I think there are plenty of scenarios where he plays. I think if Cousins is struggling, I think if Cousins gets hurt, I think if uh, you know he's playing mediocre and the Redskins are if Cousins is playing mediocre and the Redskins are contending for a playoff spot, I think that Obviously, there's going to be a lot of kind of tricky personnel moves they're going to have to make here, managing these personalities and managing expectations for the fan base and inside the locker room. But I think if Robert Griffin III is actually 100% healthy before the end of this year, I think it's pretty likely that he would play again. I just am not convinced that's going to be the case, and I don't think Jay Gruden gave us a lot of evidence to go on one way or the other yesterday. Keith, what scenarios do you see that you could see RG3 returning to the field this year for the Redskins? Well, I mean, obviously he'd have to be healthy, and I think that's the longest shot right. in, in this whole scenario. You know, the, the fact that from the orthopedist that the reporters talked to on Sunday night, uh, they said that basically, you know, a, a dislocated ankle very rarely is just a dislocated ankle. It, it has, always has complications with it. Eight weeks is like the, is the minimum, six to eight weeks. So that puts you almost into, into December, which is the very end of the schedule. But let's say he can come back, he's healthy, he can run, he's, he's himself. And Kirk Cousins is just okay, and the Redskins are, you know, six and seven or something like that. And, and the NFC East is jumbled enough where, you know, you win your, your final few games and, and you get into the postseason. Then yeah, I can I could see him playing again this season. I wouldn't bet on it, but I, but I think there's definitely a scenario, especially if if Cousins is just okay, where where he could come back and get his job back. Yeah, the, I think that's that's pretty viable actually. What do you think, Brandon? Yeah, Keith, you raised a lot of good points. I, I think it. A lot of it depends on what the situation is in, in December, because if they're out of it, the playoff race, so to speak, what, what do you put them in there as kind of like a backup so that it's not like a totally lost year? Because if it's up to RG3, he's going to come back. Right. We all know he, he wants to prove that he's, he's this franchise quarterback. So I, th I think really it's, it's, it's interesting with Jay Gruden in his first year, he's trying to have his own success, so it, it's kind of tied to what Kirk Cousins does. So if Cousins does great, I think you're, you're going to see the decision of, is this our franchise quarterback? Because like, if RG3 do, it can come back and Cousins is doing great and they pick Cousins to keep going, is RG3 error is done. It's RG3 yeah, I, I Wally under, Pip. I, really, I don't understand what the argument would be for them keeping him on the active roster. He's on the active roster, yeah? Yeah, well, the, the, all right, so the deal is, they, you only have one short-term IR spot, and they've already put Which Barry Cofield. Right, yeah. So, so yeah, you, it, the the fact that they didn't put him on IR means that they believe he has a chance to come back and play this season, or at least they want to keep the doors open. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 have, to, I have to think, that they, they think that there's like a strong chance that he plays because NFL teams aren't in the habit of wasting one of their roster spots. And right. if if we really think that is that a PR move, maybe I don't understand the play. I don't understand what the play internally. Would be. 
PR for for Robert? For, yeah, for the for inside relations within the owner, and and you don't want to put, put him on the shelf necessarily I, no, if there's I don't a chance. Think, no, I mean, if I don't he, think if NFL he, teams play he, around with right, one you do want to leave the door open because right, again, he wants to come back. If you totally shut the door on him, then you wonder mentally, what does that say about how this team feels about me that I'm just done? Uh, but, I, 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 but that's a PR move, I right? Right, rather, right. I think you'd rather not have the ambiguity. You either want to know, so okay, too. he's done for the year. Now he can Put get focused on, shelf, on right. rehab. But the, clearly, the, them not not doing that says he has a chance to come I back. I totally think so. I think that they think it's. I, I'm guessing that they think it's less serious than all these orthopedists that we yeah. talked to think it is. Yeah. I, I have wow. to believe that they think that. I believe it's a chance too. It's kind of a PR move, but I feel like <laughs> legitimately he could come back though. And it'll be all the more interesting if Cousins plays well, and then what happens if he if he does come back healthy? All right, that'll be for. Uh, the weeks to come to debate. All right, guys, let me ask you this. What percentage chance do you give, Dan, I'll start with you, to the possibility of Robert Griffin III having started his last game as a Redskin? I mean, this is amazing. Amazing <laughs> that we're having this conversation. Isn't it? I, I mean, I think there is a chance, but I would say like 4%, maybe, 4%? something like that. I mean, I think that Cousins would have to be so lights out, mm -hmm. and he would have to be so convinced that Griffin could never even come close to capturing that potential he had in his first year. I mean... I understand that these are conversations lots of fans are having and lots of national media members are having, but I mean, go to, I was at Redskins, I was at the FedEx Field on Sunday. It's like literally 50% of the people in the parking lot are wearing Robert Griffin III mm -hmm. shirts. I don't think, I just don't think that parts of two seasons and one game and a third is enough based on everything they put into this kid and everything that he showed them the first year to totally give up on him. I just think the Cousins would have to be literally Tom Brady level and, and RG3 body would have to show signs of never coming back for that to be the case. I don't. I think maybe 4% is too high, maybe 2%. 2%, all right, give me yeah, yours, Keith. You, you crushed me now, because I, I, I put 25%. <laughs> wow. And, and look, I thought I was being conservative. I figured 75% chance that Griffin gets his job back like that. Mm -hmm. Maybe it is more like 80 or 90, but I, I said 25 in the sense that it, it would have to take Cousins being, not just, even if he himself is not, the, the world's best quarterback, if he's very efficient in this offense and the team rallies around him and they win a bunch of games, whether it's 10, 11, or 12, or even if they mm -hmm. you know, won nine but won one in the playoffs, then you, have, you go into the offseason and you have to think about it. I, th I think Dan is totally right in that you built the franchise around Griffin. You have this talent that if you can harness it, if you can harness it, if you can get Griffin anywhere close to, to where he was in 2012, you have one of the best quarterbacks in the league and one of the most electrifying players in the league. You don't want to give up on that, watch him go somewhere else, and then, you know, finally hit his peak. So I think it's very unlikely that it would happen, but, but certainly the door's open for, for Kirk Cousins now if, if they are, uh, you know, exceptional with him. Huge opportunity lead. for Cousins. What percentage do you have, Brandon? I give it like 5% chance. Okay, I mean, so let, let's these. get this out of the way. 100% if, if Griffin's healthy, if Cousins is healthy, RG3 is the better quarterback. Is it better in the system? I don't know, but I, I think like Dan said, Cousins has to play pretty much out of his mind for there to be no chance that RG3 would, would come back and that he totally takes the job. And, and I th honestly, I think Cousins will do good. It might take a few games to get going because one, the NFC East is, is weak this year, so they could make a playoff run. And it goes back to that scenario, do you want to mess with that? And then two, again, if, if Jay Gruden, if his success is tied so much to the quarterback, does he want to mess with that chemistry just for the sake of how much we've invested in RG3? Because Ty was at the game, too, and talking to fans, even though they're wearing the RG3 jerseys, they care most about the team doing well. Win. So They want to win first. They'll right? switch jerseys real quick if, if the Red Seas <laughs> I mean, are making right. the playoffs. Oh, you're point, right, they would, they would, but I... It's just, it's just, I mean, 12 months, you can travel let me, so Let me far ask you this. Let me ask him, add a minute to this, and I, I want to get a quick answer for you guys on this. Let's say, let's say that Cousins plays above average. RG3 is not healthy enough to return this year. Which player has the better trade value at the end of the season for the Redskins, potentially? Ooh. Griffin. Griffin, it's because of the ceiling. Because the, the potential, even right. though the, given the injuries of three, three major ones in five years, still Griffin. That, but, that, yeah. but, but we've seen teams be tempted by that in the past, whether it's someone like Michael Vick or even you know, much earlier in his career, Johnny mm -hmm. Manziel, someone who doesn't have necessarily the body to, to withstand the pounding, but the talent is so mesmerizing that if you get it and, and, and you have that either, whether it's one season or whether you imagine an entire career. Uh, yeah, I gotta agree. I, 
I kind of hiccup for a second when you said that, but like think about it. It's crazy to even three, think three, that three we're having ago, this Griffin conversation. Second, I know, overall, I grant second that. overall pick in the draft. Yep. Cousins, every team had three yep. shots to get yep. him, and none of them did. And I mean, Cousins, maybe he plays great, and I, I don't think it's impossible that he does, but in the time that both of them have played so far, Griffin's clearly been sure. the better quarterback. So I, it would be hard to imagine it's not Griffin. You would agree, yeah, Brandon. It's still, still RG3. Same reasons. Because when he's healthy, he's, he's very good. <laughs> All right. There's, a lot, there's so much just to speculate. You know, and what, like, obviously, we're going to read a lot into you know half of a first quarter against Jacksonville. But Griffin looked great for how many minutes yeah, he played. That's true. That yeah. is true. And he completed that. Uh, even on the play that he got hurt, he looked good. All right. Um, are the Redskins more likely, Brandon, in your mind now, to be playoff contenders with a quarterback that better, quote unquote, fits the system as a as the Jay Gruden sort of system, to be a playoff contender with with a, a competent Cousins back there than they were with Red with RG three who was admitted to have been sort of a pocket project, mm -hmm. right? I don't think that it's it's any more or less like I feel like they're the same. That's not saying RG three and Kirk Cousins are the same player and they're just as good, but like we said, RG three looked like granted against the Jaguars that he was getting going in that offense on Sunday. So I still feel like, again, the NFC East is very weak, so they can make a run at the playoffs. Um, but with the weapons that are around Cousins and, and if the defense keeps playing that well, I feel like they still either way had a legitimate so shot. So you think they're contenders regardless. Right, yeah. I got you. All right, Keith, what do you think? Are they more or less likely to be playoff contenders now? I, I, I said the same as well, and I thought I was going to be the only one to say that. So, uh, <laughs> they, right, Dan, you you're can't right. say that now. You're right. They're, they're, <laughs> the quarterbacks are not the same, but their chances are, are about the same because the things that Cousins brings, the decisiveness, uh, you know, making his decisions quickly, getting rid of the ball and, and getting it in the hands of the playmakers, which the Redskins have plenty of on offense right. if they're all healthy. Um, those, are, those are things that will make the offense go. The, you know, Griffin brings that, that escapability where if everything breaks down, he can take off and run for a first down. So I think the offense is, a, is about in the same place. They may you know, function a little bit more better. Uh, more better. They, they, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you've been out for a few weeks. That's right. You're getting back into the flow. They, they, may, they may function better um, with, with Cousins at the helm early. You know, defensively, and special teams, I think they've, the special team's been up and down. The defense has looked pretty good, but let's keep in mind that they've looked good against a team led by Ryan Fitzpatrick and a team led by Chad Henney. Next four weeks, it's Nick Foles, Eli Manning, Russell Wilson, and Carson Palmer if he's healthy when they go out to Arizona. Dan, more or less likely to make the playoffs now. You know, I, I think I might be contradicting myself 15 times during this, this show. <laughs> I kind of think more likely for this season, but I don't think that means in any way that, that they'd rather be in the Kirk Cousins business than the right. RG3 business, but I just think... For example, this game in Philadelphia, based on what we've seen out of those two quarterbacks playing the Jay Gruden system, which is a really, really small sample right. size, I kind of think that they're more, more likely to beat the Eagles this week with Cousins, just because what we've seen, he seems more comfortable running this particular offense right now. You know, I think that the ceiling, like we've talked about, I think is way higher for Griffin than for Cousins. But, you know, if you're more likely to beat the Eagles, who are probably the class of the division, with Cousins in week three, then I think maybe they're slightly more likely to make the playoffs this year. But again, I think that as a franchise and as a team, your ceiling is higher with Robert Griffin III. I just think for this particular year, I'd maybe say a little bit higher with Cousins. So short term, more likely to make the playoffs this year. Longer term ceiling, much more likely to sort of make consistent runs. If I think. I don't know if that Griffin. makes sense, but that's sort of what my gut feeling Interesting. is. Yeah. What Interesting. do you think? Um, I sort of agree with you. I sort of <laughs> think the Redskins are in a, in a slightly better, just, just, just marginally, just based on the very early returns that, that uh, you know, if Cousins is as competent, again, it's Jacksonville and yeah, he looked bad at it. the end of last season too, right. that is all out there. You know, we'll I, I see really, what he looks like on the road. Ah, I, I really think that if Griffin plays that whole game, they beat Jacksonville by 30 points anyhow. Yep, right. yep. I think he, they were well on their yeah. way. Yeah, or maybe more. Yeah. I think they were definitely going to win that game. All right, um, speaking of Philadelphia, guys, uh, the Eagles 2-0, and the only team undefeated in the NFC East. We sort of expected them to be the class of the NFC East. They look at so far a uh, nice comeback win uh, Monday night in Indianapolis. Um, but they're coming off a short week, and the Redskins have a new quarterback. Uh, and, you know, give me some bold predictions. Dan, I'll start with you on this. Uh, for the Philly game, first, and first of two NFC East games for the Redskins in five days. Um, give me something. You know, I think, um, God, I, just going back and forth on myself again, I think that the Redskins <laughs> are one of nine teams that has not thrown an interception yet this season. I think that that ends on Sunday. Kirk Cousins has had trouble with turnovers in the brief time that he has played in the NFL. 
Um, and I think they're going to have to probably toss the ball around a, a decent amount to keep up with Foles and Chip Kelly's offense. I think that Cousins throws at least two interceptions two on Sunday in Philadelphia. And I should point out that last week you were the only one that was close to your bold prediction. You had Alfred Morse, 20-plus carries, two touchdowns, but you also had the 100 yards plus. He was just under that. But yeah. you, you were closest, so Thank well you. done. Two interceptions for Cousins. Sorry, Kurt. Two interceptions. Go ahead, Keith. All right, my bold prediction is Deshaun Jackson plays, scores a touchdown of 50 yards or longer. <laughs> <laughs> because it just has to happen. It, the, the it's way, a matter of time, right? right? The, way, you know, the way Philly let him go um, so uncere- unceremoniously uh, this offseason, I kind of have been convinced so, since then that he will definitely drive the stakes into the hearts of Eagles fans. At least at some point during the game, I don't think that necessarily means the Redskins win, but I think he scores, he scores a big touchdown. And it, 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 you know, now that's a little bit more of a bold prediction since he has the AC spread. Right. I was going to say, that's three straight weeks that we have a long Jackson touchdown as a, one of the bold predictions okay. for three different people. That's okay, <laughs> though. That's okay, though. This is the week. If there's going to be a week in Philly, yeah. you'll see. All right, what do you got, Brandon? Uh, I think Cousins plays well. I, he might throw a pick, but I say he throws about 300 yards, maybe a little bit more, and it comes down to the last drive. Redskins lose, but it comes down to the last drive. But it's drive. a close one, and Cousins yeah. plays well and, yeah. and keeps them in the game. I like that. Um, I, think, I, I think, if anything, it helps Washington's chances that Philadelphia pulled out that win. Because now, I, yeah. I, I think Philadelphia coming off a loss going home, I would have felt more pessimistic about the Redskins' chances. I mean, short week, game planning against a different quarterback, you never know. Crazier things have happened. Go I got Andre Roberts' first touchdown as a Redskin. Uh, he looked good on some of those connections with, with Cousins in the in the first half last week. All right, um, let's go to the NFL, guys. Week three, lots of other tasty games to look at um, beyond the Redskins Eagles. Brandon, I'll start with you. What game has your attention on the NFL slate for week three? Um, I'm interested in the Minnesota-New Orleans game because it's kind of a, a gauge of who is for real in, in that matchup. The Saints, you lost to the Browns. <laughs> the, the Cleveland Browns without Johnny Manziel. I, I know they started off bad. They kind of came back. But, you know, you expect the Saints to be there every year. And, and I know they, they've got the injury now with Mark Ingram. So, again, that's kind of want to see how they bounce back. And I'm sure they miss Darren Sproles now. They, they wish they had him. But Minnesota, on the other hand, is Matt Castle the guy long term? Or, you know, how does he handle that defense against the Saints, which – it's kind of up and down. So I think it'll be a good gauge to see who's for real in that You match. talk about the whole game without mentioning Adrian Peterson. <laughs> the well, fact that, that he right, that I did that for a reason. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't want to that. whole that. controversy is <laughs> worth watching that game for regardless. But I, yes, I very good point. We'll see. All yeah, right, what do you got, Keith? Yeah, we don't know as of Tuesday if, he, if Peterson's definitely going to play, but they definitely put him back on the roster. Right. Uh, the Saints haven't played a home game yet either, so the Saints are much better in that dome. That should be an interesting one. I'm going to go a little bit off the charts here. San Diego at Buffalo. <laughs> now, when, the, when, the, when the, the schedule came out at the beginning of the season and you saw the week three slate, nobody circled that one. Everybody right. probably circled Denver, Seattle, San Francisco, Arizona. But uh, Buffalo's 2-0. and And as much as we talk about, about Philadelphia's fast-paced offense, about the way Denver runs their offense, Buffalo's trying to run a lot of the same plays. They just don't have the, the personnel to make it look like Denver and Philadelphia make it look. But Sammy Watkins had a great week in week two. And you always, you always got Fred Jackson there. You always have uh, C.J. Spiller. Spiller, right? You know, if E.J. Manuel plays well, it, you know, they're, they're pretty good. And they beat the Bears in week one, so they, they're fairly decent. It's a cross-country trip for San Diego. Coming San Diego's off a big coming win. off a huge win right. against Seattle. So I think that's an interesting game that I certainly would, have been, would not have been interested in 10 days ago. Now I'm interested in. Yeah, right. Two and up, Buffalo, one of those surprise two and up teams. Dan, yeah, the Buffalo yours. thing just convinces me even more. We have to just stop watching preseason entirely because they look horrible <laughs> in the preseason. It's horrible. You know, I'm going to take the obvious choice, which is the Super Bowl rematch, Denver at Seattle. I think Cincinnati's certainly been impressive, but Denver may be the most impressive team in the AFC so far. They beat two playoff teams from last year, obviously both of them at home. Mm-hmm. Obviously neither of them were a blowout, and you know, both of them were in it at the end. But you beat Kansas City and Indianapolis, that's kind of saying something. Um, and Seattle, you know, all this talk about Richard Sherman, was he exposed last week? He obviously is uh, not a fan of that line of, of argument. So Sherman's going to, I'm sure, be jabbering like crazy on Sunday. I, <laughs> Seattle coming off a loss. Um, it just, I mean, it's got everything you, you want to be. I think that it's going to be a Seattle blowout, but I think it's got a lot of mm. reasons to watch. Yeah, Super Bowl. Remember. I agree. I think Seattle wins going away, especially after they lost in San Diego. They'll be even more motivated. I also like the San Francisco-Arizona game. Uh, the, the Niners yeah. going down to 2-0 and Arizona. Is Arizona for real? Could they possibly even contend in that stout division, the NFC West? If they beat uh, the Niners at home 
on Sunday. That's an early statement in that division. It'll be interesting to see if they can keep that up. All right, um, let's go to the Nationals, guys. And today is the day. It could be the day that the Nationals clinch the NL East. There's champagne behind us or something? Uh, <laughs> What's I that? I thought you were looking for someone bringing out champagne behind us. <laughs> no, we gotta, we got to put the, put the, the shower curtains Mike over White. the studio. Um, I want to talk about Matt Williams specifically, Dan. I'll start with you on this. Is should he be the leading contender right now for National League Manager of the Year? You know, as with all Major League Baseball issues, I'm so intensely focused on the local <laughs> team that sometimes it's hard to know exactly what right. other teams have gone through, what the ups and downs have been, what the managers have done to kind of keep things together. I think Williams has a case. I think tactically he's gotten better as the season has gone on. I don't think there's any question about that. I think he's pulling all the right, pu pushing all the right buttons right now. But I think that he's had a decent number of hurdles that he had to overcome from, you know, all of the Ryan Zimmerman in and out of the lineup stuff to, you know, benching Bryce Harper mm -hmm. briefly and having all of the battles with him. Um, you know, the Denard Span bryce Harper thing that happened midway through the season. And, and none of these things have become even remotely lingering issues for the Nats. You know, they just kind of plug them right along. They're probably playing their best baseball of the year right, right. now, which is another key factor. And, you know, last year they probably underachieved a little bit. This year they're probably overachieving a tiny bit. They're probably going to finish a little bit above um, what the Vegas projections would have been. So I think he's got to be at least a candidate. He's got to have done one of the best jobs after Davey Johnson really kind of made a hash out of last season. I think Williams has done as good as you could have hoped he could do. Keith, I'll uh, ask one additional question to this. How much of a factor is it that he's a first-year manager? Is that How much of a factor is that in the consideration? I, I don't think that's a, necessarily a big factor. I, I think when you, you do Coach of the Year awards, my thing is who did the most with the least? Mm. And so my first instinct would be to look at the teams that, that, were, that uh, have done well in the NL and say, all right, who, who doesn't have really the talent? And, and is doing well. Clint Hurdle in, in Pittsburgh would be a good guy to fit that. that who won it last year as well. Right, and you know, right. besides McCutcheon, who do they have that's really, really an outstanding player in right. Pittsburgh? But then when you stop and think about it, and, and some of the things that Dan mentioned, um, you know, even though the Dodgers are loaded, the Nats are loaded with talent, the Nats really had a bunch of, of, of hur hurdles mm -hmm. to overcome. I can keep <laughs> laughing because it's Clint Hurdle's name, but, <laughs> but, but I mean, they really have have overcome a lot this year whether I think the injuries you know as much as much as anything you know even going all the way back to week the, the very first beginning of the season Ramos was hurt off the bat mm -hmm. Fister didn't pitch right away I mean at every and, and now you know it Zimmer was a while out. before they got that opening day I mean, lineup at, back that's a good point at, at any given point during the season we've right the the original lineup has barely been out there and they found a way to win and now they're sort of pulling away from from the Braves so pretty impressive job by Matt Williams. What do you got, Brandon? Yeah, yes or no? I think he's a strong contender. And you, you asked kind of like the first year factor. And, and really, I think that would play to his advantage because mm -hmm. you wouldn't expect them to do this well. And, and he did probably walk into the best situation of all the, the right. first year managers. But of all the injuries, all the things they went through. And, and I remember, I guess a few months ago, we were on this set talking about can they beat the Braves? And that problem's yeah. pretty much been solved with all the winning. So I, I would say he definitely would be the leading candidate, along with the Pittsburgh's Clint Hurdle as well. But I, I guess it's been a while since the guy won back-to-back, -back, so I would think Matt Williams could get in there and win. So. You know, when I talked about the distraction, I missed the most obvious recent one, the Soriano thing. Which, I was going to say, when you're gonna I was going to bring that up. When you're going to demote a closer, I think right. that's gone about as smoothly as it could have gone. <laughs> yeah. And I don't think, I mean, I think they're pretty well, pretty well set up now where there's not going to be any kind of controversy on that one. You know, maybe Well, what do they night, do in the playoffs? Does, is he on the roster in the playoffs, postseason? I mean, it, you know, he can't be. I think last night he demonstrated. And he did it wow. in a game where they still got the win. <laughs> yep. And where he wasn't really hung out to dry. You know, he, they got him out of the game and kind of made it clear, like, he can't, he just can't do it right now. So, I... I mean, maybe he still has like a role in the sixth or seventh inning or something. He's, but he he's can't still be the closer, so he still has decisions to make. I, I think you 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 hit the nail on the head. The Zimmerman, the fact that they're playing their base, best baseball right now, I think, is the biggest argument for Williams with the Zimmerman injury and the bullpen situation, and he's handled it swimmingly uh, so far. And we'll see how that goes. Don mm -hmm. Mattingly, another guy who early in the season, if you guys remember, the Dodgers were nine and a half games back, and there were a lot of issues in LA. They've obviously they're right now nip and tuck with the Nats for the best record in the National League. He would also garner some consideration. Um, all right, guys. Well, well, plenty to watch for for next week. We'll see what the Redskins do in Philly. We'll see. Uh, we'll have the NL East champions and sort of playoff chat and pl preview stuff to talk about next week for the Nationals. Also, chance for the Orioles just up the uh, parkway to clinch tonight as well. And we'll see. Uh, there's a great story by Kilgore, the, the likelihood of our, the potential clash of a 
Beltway World Series. That we talked about that in the past. Who, who will you be cheering for? I don't. I don't oh. know. Who would I be cheering for? It's very clear. It's very <laughs> subtle. My, I thought you were just gonna jump start on Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> very subtle. My my uh, my my wardrobe today. All right. So for Brandon Parker, Keith McMillan, Dan Steinberg, I'm Jonathan Forsythe. Thanks for joining us on Post Sports Live. We'll see you next Tuesday. Same place, same time.